Well, thanks for having me, friends. It's really good to be here. Uh, we're in Daniel 6. Sorry for the break in the, in, in the series, but it's the way it goes. Uh, we're, we're, we're in Daniel 6, and this is the story that is very well known from Daniel. It's the story that made Daniel an Old Testament celebrity. It's a story I'm sure nearly all of you have heard of. It's a great story, isn't it? It's a story that we all love, a story that kids love and big kids like me also love. But, you know, it's one of, actually one of the most misunderstood chapters in the Bible. So before we get started, let me let us in prayer for God's help. Lord God, please enlighten our hearts and our minds to hear what you would have us to say. Please soften our hearts, help us to see you and your kingdom and endures forever. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you could be king for a day, what would you do? It's a, a popular turn of phrase, a popular figure of speech. But it does, it does beg the question, doesn't it? What would you do? Would you do something nice and simple? Take your family out for the most expensive day money can buy? Would you treat yourself to a day alone, doing anything you wanted? Perhaps you would have much higher, much more ambitious goals, such as eliminating poverty or world peace. Uh, Of course, we know these things can't really be done in a day, but last time I checked, none of us were going to be kings for the day either. Well, today when we come to Daniel 6, we see the decisions required of someone who actually was a king in the time of the book of Daniel when it was written. Well, the question is, would he serve his own kingdom or the eternal kingdom? And we too will be challenged to think about who will we serve? Will we bow to pressure or will we stand up for God's kingdom? the eternal kingdom. Now, to this day, we have two points. The nature of the kingdom and the eternal kingdom. So, our first point for today is the nature of the kingdom, the nature of the earthly kingdom. And we pick up in Daniel 6. It's it's a bit of a link to Daniel 5. Belshazzar was was the king before He had this massive party and he's now dead. And we have yet another king ruling over Daniel. Now, this is King Darius. Many suggest that this is Cyrus, the Persian king of the time. But, But the question here for him is, what will he do and how will he rule? Verses 1 to 2. If you look at them, no, like any other good king, he, he appointed satraps. And above them, he appointed, appointed administrators, which Daniel was one of. Now, this is a very high position, so it's clear right from the outset that, he, that this king values Daniel. His plan was to set him to rule over his whole kingdom. So Darius... His first thing to do is to have other people do his job for him. That's the dream, isn't it? Can you blame him? Rule a kingdom, but have someone else do your work for you. The trouble is, verse 4 shows us a bit of a problem. Well, these actions, they make Daniel's peers quite unhappy. So much so that they try to find a way to have him charged. But they're unable to. They can't find any dirt on him. Well, friends, it's the standard workplace trick, isn't it? Find someone that's in line for the job that you want and find ways to undermine them so that you can have the job. These men, they hate Daniel because he's in line for a promotion over them. They want the power and the prestige that comes with ruling over a kingdom or ruling over a kingdom under the king. See, they they want to build their own kingdom, 
where they rule, where, where they're the centre. And so they want to get rid of Daniel. But despite trying hard, they just can't find any dirt on Daniel. So they hatch a new plan. Aha, they realise, having observed Daniel for many years. They realise that Daniel is an upright man who serves his God. Perhaps this is a way to accuse him, to get him thrown out, to do away with him. So they hatch this plan. They hatch a plan to find a way to accuse him according to the law of his God. And we see that in verse 5. And in verses 6 to 9, the plan is hatched. The men, they come up with a way to get rid of Daniel so that they can be promoted and they can rule over this kingdom. It is the perfect plan. They know that Darius favours Daniel. But what they know more is that King Darius is concerned with his own kingdom and making himself known. He wants his kingdom and his name to reign forever. And they appeal to this in verse 6. They say, May King Darius live forever. Now, of course, this isn't their plan. They want to rule. But, but what better way to do that than just subtly, subtly appeal to the king's ego? And their great idea continues in verse 7. Follow on with me. It says that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. See, not only do they put this idea into the king's mind, they just get the, they just get the process going a bit faster. And in verse 8, they continue to appeal to his ego. They almost demand that he issues this decree. Well, pride and ego have been problems of the past kings. Darius has a choice to make. Which way is he going to go? And perhaps we see him, his pride get, get, him, get him here. What, 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 kingdom doesn't, what king doesn't want to make their name known among the people forever? So without even thinking about the consequences of his actions, what this might do to those around him, particularly Daniel, in verse 9, he foolishly and rushedly signs this policy. Well, friends, can you see the irony here? The king had planned to elevate Daniel to be ruler of his whole kingdom. But in his ego, in his haste... <clears throat> He had forgotten about Daniel. He had completely forgotten about Daniel and his God. He was interested in his kingdom and what was going on there. The earthly kingdom instead of the eternal kingdom. Now, some commentators describe verse 10 as the turning point of the chapter. I think I agree here. It's, it's where the heat really turns up for Daniel. So this law has been made... <clears throat> And the question becomes then for Daniel, whose kingdom will he serve? Will he serve the earthly kingdom or will he serve the eternal kingdom? Well, spoiler alert, we don't need to wait long. We see Daniel's response. Perhaps you might expect him to go and protest, to go and get angry and demand his rights. But his response is none of that. In fact, his response at first appears to be very undramatic. And, and we see that in verse 10. Follow on with me in your Bibles. It says, He went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. His response, 
was to do what he had always done. In the face of certain danger, he did not wilt. His response was to pray to God. But, but not only pray to God, he actually gave thanks to God. I'm not sure about you, but that's not my, that would not be my first response in this situation. And this is how much Daniel valued his relationship with God. He would prefer to be thrown to the lion's den than not pray to God. It would have been tempting, but I'm sure, just to not pray for four weeks. That's all it was, four weeks. Perhaps he, he didn't even need to do this. Maybe he could have just chosen to pray at a time when no one was looking. In the quiet times, maybe he could have closed his curtain. But for Daniel, none of these things were an option. For him, he was going to serve God's kingdom. See, although God's people at the time were in captivity in Babylon, Daniel's heart remained in Jerusalem. He was, he was determined to be faithful to God and to his kingdom. Well, friends, it's worthwhile pausing for a minute just to ask ourselves, what is our response? Not, not just to the threat of persecution, but, but when we feel deeply unsettled. Now, I, I want to recognise that we in Australia don't face the threats that many of our brothers and sisters do in terms of in other countries for being Christian. We have for a long time enjoyed peace. Peace for being a Christian. In fact, once upon a time, it was the done thing to do. But now our society is fast changing around us, isn't it? It's fast changing to be a hostile culture to the gospel, to Christian thinking. And yet, we're still not facing full-blown state-sponsored persecution that other countries do. And yet we, we still, don't we? We still have challenges every day. For us, it's been different in our workplace, in our schools, in our families, and in our friendship circles. Now, friends, I don't know you at all, but I'm quite sure that you all struggle with these things, don't you? Being a godly witness in the workplace... Perhaps when someone is slandering the boss that you find challenging, I'm sure, it, sure it's tempting to join in. Perhaps you've had conversations with people, I know I have, about the Bible stance on sexual is issues. See, we face choices every day, don't we? We face choices in our lives to be set apart for God or to blend in and conform. Well, Daniel had a, face, had a faith that was obvious in the face of certain danger. How about you? What is, what is our response? I know for myself, my temptation is to, is to join in. I know I'm the missions guy. I should be different. I should be set apart. But in my sinfulness, I sometimes join in. Or, or, I, or, I, put, or I put it out of my mind and I think about something else. Now, it would have been so easy for Daniel, and yet he remained faithful doing what he had always done. And yet this had clear consequences, didn't it? He was in breach of the decree, and to not pray for it, but for him to not pray for a day, let alone 30, it was a breach of his faith in God. And it would fly completely in the wind of what he'd done in the past. So he simply could not agree with this decree because he would be shifting his allegiance from the, from the eternal kingdom to an earthly kingdom. God is the true God. And he wanted to ignore the earthly kingdom and its comforts. 
to serve God, to serve his eternal kingdom, even if it meant, even if it meant him losing his life. And that's the reality here. That's what we see. That's the heart of this chapter. It's, it's who, about whose kingdom will you serve? God's kingdom or the eternal kingdom? Now, of course, the inevitable happens in verse 11. The men find Daniel. They find him praying. See, he had fallen into their cunning trap. Now, another thing about me is that I love Star Wars. I'm not sure if you know Admiral Akbar. That's a trap. But verses 12 and 13, they, they, remind, they remind the king of his eternal decree, which they very conveniently helped him make. See, see they hate God. They hate, they hate Daniel and his God because his kingdom, well, it's opposed. It's opposed to them and their kingdom building plans. And verse, verse 14, we see the king's distress. He'd been tricked. He'd been tricked by the very own law that he had created. He's greatly distressed because he had realized he just signed Daniel's death warrant. He was going to lose his right-hand man, the one who he had planned to have charge of the kingdom, the whole kingdom. The, The funny thing here is that despite being the king, He had no say over what he'd written, no say over this decree. He was powerless. He was powerless to save Daniel from the lion's den, despite being the king. And and this, friends, is where he has a brainwave, where he says, where he thinks, maybe, maybe his kingdom isn't actually his kingdom after all. Verse verse 16, he takes Daniel to the lion's den and he says, he recognizes, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. And perhaps this is the first hint we get from the chapter that Daniel's faith has rubbed off onto King Darius. And he sees that there is more to life than his kingdom. Here we see him assuming that there actually is a God. And that there is quite the possibility that Daniel's God could be at work. Well, so disturbed about these events that he was powerless to stop, he couldn't eat or sleep. His his consciousness that he had put an innocent man to death, it's, it's burying him. Now, in verses 19 to 20, after a terrible night's sleep... We see him rush to the lion's den, sheepishly, anxiously saying, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to save you from the lions? Now again, he realizes here that the only hope is that Daniel's God has rescued him. And you might even see it. He even speaks in a way he's expecting an answer. Now, usually if someone goes to the lion's den and they're there for 24 hours, you you don't expect them to survive, do you? So I I wonder if it just shows that he's a bit further along in his faith journey. Doesn't appear to be a full repentance and realisation of the eternal kingdom, but it seems to be a sign. When Daniel answers in verse 21 that God had shut the mouth of the lions and rescued him, Darius is overjoyed. See, for Daniel, like he has his whole life, he rejected his own kingdom. He wanted to serve God's eternal kingdom. He trusted God. And he knew that this was going to bring about persecution. Although it seemed like he was one man in the face of many enemies, his faith was certain. His faith was obvious because he knew of a greater hope, a greater kingdom, one, one that would endure. In a, in, a, in a twist of fate, the men who had falsely accused Daniel in verse 24, well, they are thrown into the lion's den. With them, their whole family. It reminds me of the old Looney Tunes cartoon, The Roadrunner. See, in The Roadrunner, there's, this, there's the sly old wily coyote 
His mission in life is to kill and eat the roadrunner. And yet somehow, miraculously, or out of stupidity, his missions always backfire. And he always gets himself injured. It's comical. It's kind of like what's going on here. See, God's plans, God's purposes for his eternal kingdom, they can't be stopped by what seems to be crafty, cunning human measures. And we see this in verses 25 to 27. Follow along with me in your Bibles from verse 25. And then King Darius wrote to all the nations and all the peoples of every language in all the earth. And now 26. I issue a decree that every part of my kingdom, my people must fear God and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. His God endures forever. And his kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will have no end. If Darius hadn't realized it earlier, when he was talking about Daniel's God, it's, it's certainly there now. He certainly has come to know this God, front and center. And, and this is the great news, isn't it? This is the good news, that it's, it's better than any, God's kingdom is better than any other kingdom. It can't be stopped. It can't be fraught by human measures. Although it seems small, although it might require suffering, and sacrifice, it lives forever. It lasts forever and it can't be stopped. Now, King Darius, he's realized that he rules, he rules this kingdom, he rules his earthly kingdom, but there is someone far greater, the kingdom of the living God. This is the very same God who has just saved Daniel from certain death. And despite man's best schemes, this God cannot be stopped. So Darius issues a decree to everyone everywhere on all the earth that they must fear the living God whose kingdom endures forever. Isn't this just the right response? When you realize your finitude, when you realize who you are, even as a king, that everyone serve God's eternal kingdom. Well, have you noticed the parallels here with Jesus? Because we're meant to notice them. The similarities here are quite remarkable. So King Darius, he was guilt-ridden in sending Daniel to the lion's den. However, he was powerless to stop it because, he was, because of his, his own decree. Likewise, Pilate in Jesus' trial, he knew that Jesus was innocent and he tried continually to wash his hands of it and to release Jesus. But the court of public opinion sent Jesus to the cross. Well, friends, the similarities don't end here. Like Daniel, Jesus was persecuted for his faithfulness to God. In Jesus, the kingdom of God has come. But, but not, in the way that we, not in the way that the people expected it. It came in the form of suffering, in the form of being a servant, in the form of Jesus dying on the cross for sin. It looked very different to what everyone expected. See, we're not perfect. You only have to spend five minutes with, a, with, your, with each other to realize that. We've all sinned. We all deserve God's punishment. We stand before a ho- when we stand before a holy God, God's punishment, it's something far worse than being thrown to a lion's den. Like how Daniel trusted in God and he was saved. If we trust in Jesus and his resurrection, we too can be saved. We too can be brought into this eternal kingdom, which we've heard about today. 
This, though, is, it's only possible through the resurrection which Jesus brings about. In Daniel, we see a sealing of the stone of the tomb with the king's signet ring. So too, Jesus' tomb was sealed with a big stone in his burial. And yet Jesus appears from the tomb alive with a resurrected body. The difference here is that Jesus actually died. And he actually rose again. Daniel did none of those such things. Jesus rose from the death as a final demonstration that sin and the devil and God's work had been beaten. Sorry, Satan's work had been beaten. (laughs) This is the hope to which the book of Daniel is alluding to. It's a kingdom that will endure forever, that will not be destroyed. One which Jesus rules. He rules with the Father, a kingdom without end. Well, just as, just as God brought Jesus from the death, as a final demonstration that sin and the devil had been beaten. This is the hope. This is the hope that the kingdom of Daniel, the, the, king, the book of Daniel is alluding to. A kingdom that will not be destroyed. One in which Jesus rules. Just as God brought Jesus from death, so too will he for those of us who trust in him. So friends, what does this mean for us? Well, I've already mentioned that those who trust in Jesus, we will face pressures, persecutions to conform. So I'll give you some other application. Well, maybe maybe you're someone who doesn't trust in Jesus. Maybe you're building your own kingdom. Maybe this is your first time here. Friends, this event is a factual event in history, like the resurrection. You've heard this message today. Please, please, don't walk away from here unchanged. If you haven't considered Jesus before, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus, consider him, the one whose kingdom is eternal and who holds the hope for the resurrection. Maybe we might last a hundred or so years if we're lucky. But the hope of the resurrection is eternal life. Don't, don't walk away from here without considering it. But maybe you're like Daniel and you do trust in God. Then, then take comfort. That knowing that as you live like Daniel, don't be afraid to live distinctly as one of God's very own children. God will advance his kingdom through our witness. It might not be as distinct as Daniel. Maybe too, I don't know. Whatever situation God has placed you in, be faithful. We must continue to be faithful to live out our lives, to be distinctive to the world, as 1 Peter 2.12 says. It's a whole of life thing in our work, in our family, in our social lives. Another thing, Daniel's prayer life, well, it's something to be encouraged by, isn't it? It's certainly not a prescriptive how to pray, but it's a reminder to us of the importance of regular healthy, devotional life. I know things get busy in Sydney. I know, I know our lives seem busy. Lots of things that demand our time, our work, our commutes, our families. But don't let this be at the expense of your relationship with God. There are so many tools that we have at our disposal, great material to read through, great sermons, all sorts of things. So spend time with God in his word and prayer. And finally, as we finish, have a think about the fact that you are not king of your own life. Dwell on how you can go about your your week this week living for God's kingdom and not your own. Perhaps that's a conversation you can have afterwards. As Daniel's faith was obvious, his commitment to this eternal kingdom was obvious, so too should ours be. 
when you're presented with challenges, when you're presented with chances to stand out, make sure you take them and give thanks to God for them. On that note, let me, let me lead us in prayer now as we come before the Lord, giving thanks for Daniel 6 and for his kingdom and eternals for, that, it, that endures forever. Lord God, we thank you for the witness of Daniel. We thank you that he knew your kingdom and endured forever. And we pray that we would take this, we would take, we would stand strong. We would stand strong in the face of extreme danger. We would take this to heart. Help us to be faithful to you and to remember that although suffering might come in that your kingdom, it's greater than we can ever imagine. Help us to take heed of this and to love you with all our heart. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.